The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the last lecture of Movement 2 of Berlioz's Symphonie Fantastique. Of course, this is not the last lecture of the entire series. There will be three more movements to come, and I can't wait to dig into them. But for now, let's take a look at this beautiful, intriguing ending which, as you recall, was set up with some really fantastic, glowing, glittering tutti scoring on the previous screen from last lecture. Now, everything suddenly comes to a stop. Notice that the flute is marked piano, and the clarinet and horn are marked pianissimo. So everything stops, but these long A's are being held. This is written F sounding A down a sixth in the E horn, and of course just a simple A as written in the flute. Now, as these A's are being held, this clarinet comes out from nowhere, sounding A on the same exact pitch as the E horn, and it will change the context of these A's rather than being the tonic of an A major chord to the dominant of a D major chord because it slurs upwards to sounding D and it continues on with a restatement of the E day fix. And what's lovely here is right at the end it modulates back with the help of this E note here in the flute and this sounding G sharp in the E horn to A major. And when it gets to the end of this phrase, there's a beautiful reaction from the harps, just this kind of cascading downwards very gently and elegantly. And now the answering phrase, also by solo clarinet, which is being played over this pad here, which is simply C-sharp thirds in the E horns. And it's a continuation onward of the E day fix in a very impressionistic, searching way, culminating in these thirds here, played by both clarinets. This wonderful moment of serenity and release, ending with these octaves, with the second clarinet turning it into a ninth. Just such beautiful, elegant, simple scoring. It's almost chamber scoring in a way, really, but it is orchestral and symphonic in that it is providing some breathing space to the audience to just allow them to have this moment of elegance and eloquence. And it also says a lot about the story of the symphony, which is that the artist sees his object of desire at this ball, and the memory of that sort of haunts his dreams. It continues on with him. and. This is just his little memory of seeing her, right? Whenever you hear the E day fix, you know that Harriet is either being remembered or being observed. What I feel is the strongest element here is, of course, the clarinet and that wonderful quality of calmness. It's an example of how expressive an instrument without vibrato can sound. So it really has to do with the inflection and the way that the lines are scored. You'll notice that there is very little in the way of hairpins on this, but the lines are scored in such a way and in such harmonic context that the expression is baked right into the part. In this context, the flute 
and the horns are the perfect accompaniment to the clarinet because they have a complementary timbre. Not the same timbre, but there's a certain kind of square wave sound to all these three instruments, which help to create not a homogeneous picture, but as I said, complementary. In other words, the timbres really support each other in a unique way that bonds them together. Because, of course, this note is exactly the same as this note. And if the first horn player is playing too loudly, then you will not hear the beautiful start of this clarinet solo. And the same thing goes for right here. If the first horn player is playing this sounding E too loudly, then this same sounding E in the A clarinet is going to be buried. So you really need some control here, and of course experienced players will not have a problem. Semi-pro players will probably have to hash this out with their conductor as they learn this piece, maybe for the first time or play it for the second time. But even having said all that, it is not really that hard on a competent player to pull all of this off. Immediately, <laughs> there's this huge reaction from the ensemble. And this is such a cleverly done tutti. One of the fun things about this is that when you listen to it, you feel like it's this massive chordal reaction where everybody is kind of playing a harmonized version of the main theme. But the actual truth here is that the theme is just being played by the instruments on top. And there are some pitches on the inside that line up with the melody, but they aren't necessarily melodic in function. And actually, very few instruments are being used on that melody. It really is just first violins here playing very simple double stops. These higher pitches being fingered on the E string and this open A string being played underneath it. And then, of course, a B octave and a B sixth is really no big deal. And this will be an open D on the bottom here for these octaves and a sixth at the end here. That's all really simple double stop scoring. And the top pitch is being doubled by our flute and piccolo. Now, some of these pitches are going to be doubled from the inside harmonically. Like, for instance, this E right here in the seconds. And this A right here by the violas. But there isn't really any instrument here in the middle that calculatedly doubles that melody from below. Berlioz has just added certain pitches and a little bit of harmonic motion inside this big tutti to provide a basis for what your ear is going to tell you is octave doubling, but it isn't really melodic in function for the instruments that are playing those notes, is what I'm trying to say. It's very, very clever, and maybe obvious in a way, but Berlioz thought of that first. It sounds so ballroom and so elegant and really it's the bandmaster whipping up the crowd and getting them ready for the last push in this big waltz. Tempo con fuoco, so we're really going fast now. Much faster than before, so really there's no way to individually play each of these notes. This will really have to be an unmeasured tremolo. It's another great individual, perhaps groundbreaking use of a string technique within a symphony. This whole idea of da da, da da, you know, sforzando, that today is almost a cliche. But do you remember a couple of lectures back when I talked about the whole idea of the 3 1 rhythm that Berlioz was using in his horn pad? So here you're seeing it fulfilled by everybody in the entire orchestra, and especially by this lovely idea of the sforzando tremolo. And this is just so exciting. This is something that I could probably sit around and spend hours breaking down in terms of how the harmony works really well. But all I will say for now is that once again, the instruments are placed very, very beautifully in they're powerful registers, and they're balanced in a really great way, except for the harps. And 
I've been talking about how the harps kind of don't add a whole lot in these big, loud, fortissimo tutis, except for a possible quality of color. And that is certainly true right in here. If you have two harpists, maybe four harpists, playing this, and right in here, you won't really hear the individual harpists, even if they're doing a lot of rolling. I mean, you might hear the rolling more than you will actually hear the tone quality from those harps. But overall, the timbre will be different than if the harps were not there, right? So that is no big excuse for you to go out and write all these complicated pianistic-like harp lines and expect the harpist to learn them and expect them to be happy as they sit there in the back not being heard, right? Don't score something for harp that doesn't contribute anything especially if it's very complicated and very much a pianistic kind of part, and even worse, if it is the actual piano part of what you're orchestrating, just realized as harp. That's the kiss of death. Just don't do that. Please do not do that. Notice that even though this sort of appears to be what you might think of as pianistic scoring, it really is very easy to play. Those octaves in the left hand for the harp and these simple triads, octave and a fifth, and so on. That all fits under the harpist's hand very, very well. What is sort of persnickety is when you've got a very complicated melody with lots of pedal changes and maybe a lot of polyphonic kind of scoring where the two hands are playing very independently and in really specific ways that inflect certain notes and so on and so forth and then the harpist brings this fugue or whatever else you've scored to the orchestra rehearsal and they can't even hear themselves play let alone knowing that anybody else out there will hear them so don't do that really study harp scoring effective harp scoring and know that what you're going to score is going to contribute something to the tone picture so here it's a case of the harpist not really contributing a lot in terms of being able to hear them, but just adding a certain kind of a color to the sound. And these horns are scored right in their sweet spots. It's all going to sound great, but what are they accomplishing? They're basically going to bury the harps. <laughs> and something of that is a bit true here as well in the winds. Now, if it were just the strings playing along with the harps, I think you would hear the harps just fine. Or if things were marked down a little bit in dynamic, then you would hear the harps fine. But in this big tutti, they're not going to come through very well. Here you see some of that same scoring approach as before, right? You've got the open A below and high notes above on the E string. Very, very simple double stop. But look how strange this ends up looking with this C sixth right in here, which is going to be enclosed by the first violins. Just a matter of freeing up what your expectations are when you know some of the available notes. This is certainly way easier to play than if you had an A third being played by the second violins and you had A sixths above being played by the firsts. So this way, it just really has a big, wide sound and is very powerful, very, very effective 2T scoring. Now, this is interesting right in here. Horns and winds plus harp with a string reaction on the second eighth. I would say the second beat, but basically at this point, the conductor is actually just beating the downbeat of each bar. Let's listen to all of that. This big 2T page with this big, huge, massive scoring and really just observe where the melody is in this and how it almost appears that everybody is playing a big harmonized melody when it really is just a lot of very clever positioning of certain notes in the harmony below with a very prominent melody above. And then on the previous page, of course, this lovely moment of calmness being shepherded by the clarinet just such a wonderful idea right in here, and a great way to bring back in the E-Day fix. Listen for all that, and then I'll see you on the other side.
for the second half of this final lecture on movement two. Now for the mad dash to the end. Berlioz is really going to wind up the listener and his imaginary legion of dancers. Very much, like I said before, a knowing approach of somebody who is very experienced with seeing these kinds of ballroom orchestras and dances. And yet, amplified enormously. I do not think that the typical waltz would have been as elaborate as this during this particular time. That was to come, I believe. In fact, there is a kind of a sense that within maybe 10 or 15 years, that Vienna had just been taken over by waltz composers who had these kind of long pieces similar to this movement that were very elaborate and definitely had some choreography that the general dancing public... I wouldn't call them the general public because they would all be aristocrats, but the general dancing enthusiast aristocrat would be expected to follow. Okay, well, but in this case, we have the melody starting in the cellos, and the violas come in just as soon as they can. Notice that it starts off just a little lower than where the violas can reach in the cellos. Once it gets to the C sharp, yeah, technically the violas could come in here, but... Since everything is just going so fast, it's better that they come in right on the beat. So this is doubling at pitch, not at an octave. And that continues on. Notice the use of a double sharp. As I've said before, try not to compensate by marking, say in this case, a G natural, because that will end up in awkward finger placement. The viola player will just move their finger over to G rather than walking down to F double sharp. This continues on and notice it actually gets fairly high for the cello with this doubling at pitch. Then the violins come in. So here you do have an octave doubling situation where the firsts are playing on top and the seconds and violas are doubling at pitch below. And it really is terrifically exciting to be a violist <laughs> right in here because you've got the melody and you are just going with it all the way to the end of this screen and even beyond, all the way up to treble clef. And it's kind of fun to play, actually. It fits under the fingers better than you might think. There are a couple of little awkward places, but it's actually pretty easy to play. Now, what is everybody else doing? It's actually incredibly simple, what's going on. So this beautiful long phrase is essentially just a scale. A, G sharp, F sharp, E, D, C sharp, B. Then ending with a chord. However, this A completes that line right in here. Notice that when we got to the end here, and we got all the way down to this C-sharp, the next note has to be a sixth, because there is just no way for a clarinet to get any lower, unless it were an A Bassett clarinet, which would not have been available to Berlioz. So he compromises just by throwing in complementary pitches that harmonize. So in this case, a sounding D, and then a sounding C-sharp which fits in really nicely with this A major chord right in here. Notice one other thing, too, and that is that the C horns have been silent throughout all the way up to here, where they get an E. 
so that they can underline the cadence going from 5 to 1. If you look at the double bass part, we can see that although it starts off with a 1 and a 5, an A and an E, right in here, the whole pattern of walking downwards in a scale is taken up. However, it's not on the same pitches, even though it sort of looks like that, right? You've got a written A here and you've got a written A there. Well, this written A is actually concert pitch A, sounding down an octave, of course. However, this is sounding F sharp. So right in here, the double basses are just going to harmonize at a third. And then jumping to G sharp here, to help underline the cadence with the horns and then going to this A major chord and, and low A note. Now throughout all this we've got our two harp parts alternating these octaves and you know something they didn't really need to do that. There is no pedal changes that are really required in here so that one harp can compensate for the other. There isn't anything tricky about these octaves that would really require technically one harpist getting their hands set up and playing and then taking a bar to get their hands set up again. There isn't anything like that that really requires it. However, the back and forth is more for the sense of interest for the conductor and the harpists and the audience to hear these little plinking octaves, C sharp, C sharp, C sharp, going back and forth on either side of the stage. I think that this is a passage that in particular would be interesting with four harpists set up in two sets of two on the stage. What's kind of interesting here is that the harps don't necessarily play along exactly with these clarinets and horns all the time. Sometimes they do, like for instance this G sharp right in here. And they don't necessarily play along with the basses all the time because right here you've got a C-sharp pitch being played in subsequent octaves. So that actually helps the harp part to be heard by the listener. You'll hear in the recording that I used that it's still a bit hard to hear the harpist right in here. Perhaps if there really were two on either side of the stage in this recording, it would be a lot easier to hear. Or if they close mic them or something. And then, of course, right in here, we've got the octave E's contributing to the cadence. Now, right in here, you are just not going to be able to hear this at all under the blaze of these horns. And the fortissimo of the middle strings right in here. And then from here on in, I would say, unless the harps are mic'd a little bit, they're just going to disappear into this riot of sound that is getting ever louder. Notice that all the same, Berlioz pulls back to a mezzo forte, right? I think he wants not just the harps to be heard a little bit better, but he wants this build to really take over. Now, one last thing I'll say about this. I really have been a bit critical of Berlioz's balance here in the harps, but it's just realistic. It's not really saying that oh, Berlioz didn't know what he was doing. It is a given that Berlioz was covering new ground, so of course he didn't know everything about what he was asking. I'm sure that he observed in the first premiere of this work that the harps were very difficult to hear. I think that he was playing the bass drum part towards the end of the symphony himself as a member of the orchestra of his own piece. Doubly so, he wouldn't have been able to hear the harps all that well sitting at the back of the orchestra. All the same, if you are faced with a situation like this and you just want the harps to keep going for their own sake and maybe to stand out a little bit if there's some ability to balance them, I would mark this fortissimo. And I would try to keep the orchestra down to, say, mezzo piano at the beginning and then you would have a chance of hearing the harps at first, but then by the time you got to the end of a phrase like this, they would once again get buried. Because despite these ottavas right at the ends of these little phrases, they're just not placed high enough to plink over the orchestra. Okay, well we talked about how the melody continues onwards here. 
with all the upper strings. What I didn't mention was how the cellos join in, first doubling the violas at pitch, along with the second violins, and then dropping a further octave below them, and staying in a really comfortable place, pretty much where they were before. So all they have to do is play what they learned a few bars ago, and continue on with that. Really is identical in terms of pitch. This is one of the benefits of having these really big, long screens. The double bass part is exactly the same as before. So all that remains is to examine what is going on in the horns and the winds. Well, we've got the same thing happening again there, too. Our so-called unison, but for you, ah, too, horns, are going to be playing the same. Bum, 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 bum. And here we've got the clarinets doubling this time at pitch with the horns. But when they get to this point right in here, the clarinets jump up. So instead of playing the next note in order, which would be what? Remember your transpositions? Okay, so this would be an E, right? A, G sharp, F sharp, E. But right in here, Berlioz goes to a B. Now the possible loss of tone weight is compensated for by adding an E on the same pitch here. So remember, transposing down an octave. The third horn doubles the first and second. Different tuning, same pitch. Now this is kind of interesting. Going to a sounding D here, written B flat. And even though that note is completely within reach for the natural third horn in C, they could just walk down one step, and that would be a totally easy thing. Berlioz asks for this A coming in, <laughs> and also this A right in here. So my keen observers will have noted that there is a hidden parallel fifth right in here. I said I wouldn't focus on the harmony that much in these lectures, but this is really worth pointing out because it's kind of fun. It fits in with the rules fine because you've got the third of the chord as well. So it isn't an exposed naked parallel fifth, but it's built right into this descending figure. So that's kind of fun. We arrive at a C-sharp here. The C horn sticks with an A. We've got this E down here, and everything is being set up for the cadence. We're going to turn to the next screen in a second, but just notice right in here that our winds are playing the same exact pitches up an octave and two octaves, if you count the piccolo. So A, C sharp, F sharp, and then E jumping up an octave, just because it's getting too low for these instruments. And then E, D, C sharp. Now when we get here, this is a real interesting thing, that the clarinets start to join in with the upper winds. So along with the growing dynamic strength, we have a growing intensity of how this passage is being scored. Essentially, the clarinets do not have to help out once it gets to right in here, where the horns are going to be playing forte. Well, neither do the harps for that matter, even if they were marked up to fortissimo and the conductor took pains to really come in softer so that you could hear the harps, which I think would be a mistake. But by the time you get here, you might hear this little plink at the top, but you will not really hear the other stuff going on. One little note before I turn to the next screen, and that is, it's deceptive, isn't it? Looking at this and thinking, oh yeah, so the clarinets play C-sharp too. No, they don't. They play A, right? Don't forget your transposition. We are reading a part for clarinets in A. So the clarinets are harmonizing here. And then in the next bar, you can see that they are really playing E, G-sharp inside this octave leap here, B to B. And that just helps the harmony to be all the more rich right in here. Then we've got that little partially chromatic run up to the A. This time Berlioz is fulfilling 
the run by going all the way up to the very high A there. It's good, the logic that he used before, a lecture or two ago, by not going all the way, just going all the way up to F sharp and then jumping down. Because here, that almost shrieking quality can signify that the end of the piece is coming, that this is the absolute most frenetic, most triumphant, most upward-reaching passage in the entire movement. And it just is all a matter of where is the register. Let's continue on, starting with the melody. Right here at Z, or Z, depending on what part of the English-speaking world that you're in, we have a trading off of the theme. Now, this might seem, oh, really obvious. You know, you're just having a little bit played by one, a little bit played by the other. But it's really important for Berlioz to distinguish the fact that some instruments are completing the phrase, like right here on this A, and some instruments are restarting. And the way that that is achieved is by having this big difference in register between the seconds and the cellos. So that sort of forces the ear into the difference between the two pairs of string groups. So to start with <laughs> the violins and violas, you end up with this A. See, we've gone to treble clef here, right? On the same A, the seconds start this whole upward running phrase with the cellos two octaves lower, not one octave, but two octaves lower. And the cellos run up to the E, and then the violas come in on the E an octave above, and the first an octave above that, and then they complete the phrase, and then the whole cycle starts again. And you can feel not only that wonderful sense that the top line is continuous, but that the two pairs of string groups are trading off. And that's a wonderful contrast, a wonderful pulsing of energy across the string section. An interesting idea that keeps it from just being the average tutti where everybody is going nuts, such as we saw two screens ago. At the same time, we've got these big harp chords. The more rolling of these chords, the more audible they will be. And especially considering that there is nothing on the downbeat of these bars past Z, except for just the strings hitting these octaves all at the same time. I didn't mention the double basses because they're just hitting ones and fives, so no big mystery there. But then again, so are the harps. They're basically playing the one chord and the five seven chord over and over again. So the more that they roll and the louder that the harpists play, and here is where I think that this will be a bit more audible if you actually had double harps on either side of the stage. Once again, not saying that doubles make the harps essentially louder, but they give it more body of tone that can come through a thicker texture. Well, despite all of that, just the wash of reverb through the hall that is happening in between these two boop boops in the winds and horns might be enough to sort of cover right on this rest the sound of the harp coming in. So it just depends on the hall too, doesn't it? These chords are all really simple in construction. You can see that this is not unison, but A2, C horns, playing an octave lower and they basically just play that throughout the entire eight bars right in here. And these are C sharp sixths, alternating with D augmented fourths, so you get that leading tone on the top, and just going back and forth to form ones and five sevens. And right here, A clarinets are playing C sharp sixths, and then B sixths, going back and forth and back and forth. Then we've got this really cool idea, I feel, with the topmost winds, which is actually kind of fun when you think about it. It is essentially a 6-3 chord, right? You've got C-sharp on the bottom with oboe, and then E above that, and then A at the top, which sounds an octave higher than written, right? 
Then right here we get a 6-4 chord on E, back to a 6-3 A chord, and so on and so forth, going back and forth. Pretty standard 1s and 5s when you think about it, except that the scoring is so high and bright. And, like I said before, the intense sound and the wash of reverb may cover the sound of the harps, or may not, depending on the hall. Now this is kind of clever right in here. We have these repeated notes going to C-sharp minor. That's a really wonderful harmonic contrast. All real simple to play. Here he's marking divisi, fair enough, because you've got that high note of G-sharp right in here. I would actually score this in tenor clef, but it's not totally needed. And these C-sharp fifths are being doubled by the horns. This, once again, is E, providing that middle minor third. C-sharp on the bottom with your double basses. And then right in here, E octaves, E sixths, and then that G-sharp right in the middle of both of these intervals. Some of the same notes here. G-sharp with your piccolos and oboes, a very penetrating team up to put the piccolo an octave higher than the oboe, and then right in the middle you've got your first flute part on the E. And of course these are going to be C-sharp octaves filling in the missing piece between E and G-sharp, and then also providing that open C-sharp fifth an octave higher than the horns and cellos. So really beautifully scored chord right in there, I would say. These are fairly simple double stops. A little tricky getting the intonation just right on these E fifths over the G sharp right in here. This I think is a little bit easier having the fifth below and the G sharp above because that forms the sixth at the top of the fingering scheme rather than at the bottom of it. But these stacked sixths right in here are the easiest of all to play I would say. And this right in here is perfectly possible. It seems, wow, like a triad. How do you do that? It's very simple because the top note is an open E. So you just finger these on the second and third strings. And same thing here. Now notice, right in here, and I would say throughout the entire page, Berlioz has really kept his bases up. And seeing as how there are also no bassoons, it takes a certain amount of gravity out of the bottom end of the orchestra as well. Here I feel the harps will come through pretty nicely as they are scored so high, especially the first harps, supposing that you had two on a part. This will come through pretty well too. I think the lower notes are going to get swallowed. Here you get a rare high E in the piccolo. Berlioz has really held off on scoring too high for the piccolo throughout this symphony. Of course, when we get to the last movement, that changes because he wants a more shrieking kind of a sound. But here in the second movement, he really wants it to be as elegant as possible. But this will all sound very beautiful and bright and clear above the strings and the horns and alongside the harps. So it's the kind of scoring that complements the harp scoring, I would say. And if you had no horns and more limited strings right in here, you would hear that even more. So let's have a listen to all of those things. I won't enumerate them too much, but just to say, see if you can hear the harps coming in on the downbeat of each bar right in here. Listen for the way that the groups contrast right in here between the different strings as the melody rushes to the top. That's another thing too. The intensity of the strings can easily bury the harps even though the harps are playing these big rich chords and the strings are just playing octaves and doing these melodic runs at the same time. Listen for the overall brightness of the scoring with the basses being positioned so high. Listen for the elegance of this descending line here with the clarinets and the horns and how they come back in here and then harmonize in some parts. Third horn and the clarinets right in here, rather than just continuing on like they did before. 
listen for how the winds sort of elevate those octaves and how they leap up halfway through. See if you can hear the plinking of these octaves here in the harps and judge for yourself how effective the harp scoring is from that point onwards. And of course, this wonderful rushing push forwards in cellos and violas changing to pretty much the entire section except for the basses from that point on. And I will see you pretty soon for the first lecture of the third movement, which I can't wait to share with you, because as interesting and innovative and sheer fun as this movement is, the third movement opens up yet another page of brilliance by its composer. Thank you.